My name is Paul Flatter, and I'd like to welcome you to um, this evening's lecture on behalf of the Refugee Studies Programme and the European. We're co-hosting this event, and the director of the um, programme is, is Alex Betts, who will be commentating later. Um, the European, if I can say a word, well, both organisations were set up in the 1990s, which seem a long time away now, looking back, and those were more halcyon days, I think. Um, but we didn't know it then. You were 1982. You were 1982, <laughs> were you? Yes. But the forced migration program. Yes. yes. It became a centre in the 1990s. Okay. Because I actually worked to fundraise for the centre with Barbara Harrell Bond and others when I arrived here. So you, you are where, where I kid compared to you. Um, we're going to celebrate 25 years next year, and you're already 35. Um, we were set up. Um, as an international body, and we're both kind of international bodies, and there's great international feeling um, tonight, um, as, as you can see in the theme of the lecture. And our aim was to bring together experts with uh, younger scholars and to discuss issues of current concern. And I think we're achieving that. We've got our experts, we've got our younger scholars, and I think humanitarianism is always a concern, and perhaps more so now uh, because of recent failures of. of, of interventionism and perhaps because of what happened last week in, in, in America. Um, it's somehow got greater, greater um, relevance and piquancy. Um, the lecture is for us uh, part of a, a, a regular series that's now been running since 2000 linking uh, Oxford and Geneva. Oxford and Geneva always had strong ties, it's the Graduate Institute in Geneva, but through this program we've been able to do a series of of, of exchange lectures. We have very distinguished figures from Geneva, and we've sent over um, many distinguished figures from here. And I think Adam Roberts, who will be joining us, is, is one of our previous uh, Oxford uh, lecturers in, in, in Geneva. And we've also had, here he is, uh, <laughs> just saying, Adam, that you're one of our previous uh, European lecturers in Geneva. And also, the post that he held, the Montague Burton Chair, actually, which is uh, very distinguished chair of international relations here has a little known requirement that the professor visit Geneva each year to keep himself updated. Not that Adam needed to do that because he's always updated, but he did actually, I think, fulfill that duty um, uh, with, with due diligence. Um, and actually, later on, one of our previous um, scholars to Geneva will be joining us, but he's got a tutorial at the moment. So, I basically want to welcome you. I'm delighted to see such a um, great audience. Really looking forward to the talk. And my last duty is really to hand over to, to Guy Goodwin Gill, who will um, run proceedings from now. Um, Guy is a much admired and distinguished scholar, as, as I'm sure most of you, um, if not all of you, already know. And especially in these troubling times when we're discussing the, the crisis around migration, he's a very forceful and outspoken voice has been very valuable to the debate. He's also a great friend of both our organizations, um, and I'm proud to say that uh, perhaps the European helped to bring him here in the 1990s as a, a distinguished uh, research fellow, and he stayed a friend um, as he's been elevated to all souls and to many other posts. So Guy, can I hand over to you? Um, and thank you for coming. Thank you very much, Paul. It does give me a great deal of pleasure to, to welcome Gilles Carbonnier here tonight. Um, as you'll have heard from Paul's introduction, my own area of concern for more years than I care to, be, to mention has been refugees and migration, and it seems to me that there's never a day when that hasn't been a, a situation or subject mired in, in crisis, usually a, a political crisis of the making of the politicians themselves. Uh, but Gilles Carbonnier's focus is on one with which I also am particularly concerned, although peripherally perhaps. He will be talking to us today about the case for humanitarian economics and recalibrating civil war and disaster. And I think before I, I hand over to him, just a few words will show how very qualified he is to talk <coughs> to this subject. He has a, a PhD in economics from the University of Neuchâtel, and he's the Editor-in-Chief of International Development Policy. But he has over 20 years of professional experience, much of it indeed, in areas which have themselves been the subject of, of conflict and displacement. He, 
spent two, had two periods of service with the International Committee of the Red Cross, which took him, amongst others, to Iraq, uh, Sri Lanka, Ethiopia, and El Salvador. And it's therefore with very great pleasure that I invite you, Gil, to address us tonight on this very important and very topical subject. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Professor Guru Ngil, uh, ladies and gentlemen, esteemed colleagues, I must say that I feel really privileged and uh, somewhat humbled to have the chance to participate in this European lecture in such a gorgeous venue, <clears throat> filled and charged with history. And <clears throat> I wish to thank wholeheartedly the European, and in particular Paul Flader, for the initiative and the invitation. And uh, I wish at the same time to thank uh, the Refugee Study Center, and in particular Alex Betts, for having accepted the heavy task of uh, serving as discussant. I have to tell you that it's actually in my life the second time that I participate in a European event. And the first time was just less than a month ago. And uh, it was a very lively one, I must say, because we had, among others, on the panel, uh, Norbert Hofer, who is the leader of the populist party in Austria, Freedom Party. And our student in the Graduate Institute decided to do two things demonstrate loudly outside of the conference room and protest silently inside the room. So I thought, well, is, this is European, what's to expect here? But I see that it's, it's much more relaxed <laughs> and, and, and quiet in Oxford. I'm glad about that. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I'd just like to start by, by saying that the field of humanitarian economics is an emerging field of practice and of research and studies holds a largely untapped potential to help researchers, but also policymakers and practitioners, to better understand the crisis of today, but also to enhance the humanitarian outcomes of responses that we try to bring in crisis areas. And I think that economic analysis, political economy analysis, can greatly help but at the same time, if we leave it to economists alone in a monodisciplinary manner, it might be a recipe to add catastrophe to disasters. <laughs> and I have a quote here that really remarkably illustrates what I want to say. It's a quote by Jack Hirschleifer, who was a long-time professor of economics at UCLA. And in 1993, not so long after the end of the Cold War, he had a presidential address to the 19, in 1993 to the Western Economic Association International. And he started by saying, as we come to explore this continent, meaning conflicts, economists will encounter a number of native <laughs> tribes, historians, sociologists, philosophers, etc., who in their various intellectually primitive ways have preceded us in reconnoitering the dark side of human activity. Once we economists get involved, quite properly, we'll of course be brushing aside these ad theoretical aborigines. <laughs> so I think that the, the first part of this statement is quite true. Economists have been very late in coming to grip and studying civil wars. And this is quite astonishing in a sense because during the Cold War, most of developing economies have been black plagued and suffered from civil wars and development economists and others have mm. widely neglected this phenomenon as not being amenable to economic analysis. At the same time, the second part of his statement is problematic and as far as I am concerned, my awakening to the issue of civil war and genocide for that matter was a conference given in Geneva by the former advisor to President Javier Rimana. He was a European economist, and when a year after the genocide he came to Geneva, he said, I knew that we were pushing for economic reforms that intensified political tensions, but this was none of our business. <laughs> 
He mainly said that he could discuss about it while drinking beers after work, but this was not part of his work. And basically, once the genocide started, he handed over his files to humanitarian colleagues, and he was sent as economic advisor to Southeast Asia. <laughs> so, based on that, uh, of course, a lot of uh, work has been invested in trying to better understand the economic dimensions and political economic dynamics of a humanitarian crisis. And this is how I define humanitarian economics, which involves humanitarian responses, aid, as part and parcel of war economies and disaster economies. So let me just mention three main reasons why uh, I wrote this book uh, right now. The first is that the humanitarian market has been booming. It has been booming for the past 25 to 30 years. And it is still booming. The latest figure for last year uh, portray a market of 28 billion US dollars, three quarter funded by governments and one quarter by private, mainly individuals. Actually, foundations and companies account only for a teeny fraction of that uh, 25 person coming from private sources. And the first part of the question that I raises why do we see such a boom? Does it respond to a huge increase in needs for humanitarian assistance? If we just look at appeals for funds from the UN, it is the case. But if we look at proxy indicators, the picture is much more mixed. First, if we look at armed conflicts, the standard database by Uppsala University, we see that the number of armed conflicts has actually decreased sharply from 52 in 1992 to 29, 30 in 2003. And since then fluctuating between 30 and 40. It's true that over the past two or three years there has been an increase again in the number of armed conflicts. If we look at the intensity of armed conflicts through the database of Maryland University, we see also over the same period a decrease of about 60% in the intensity of armed conflict, especially during the 1990s, then an increase in recent years. Then if we look, and here I speak under the authority of my two esteemed colleagues, but if we look at the number of refugees, we have seen during the 1990s a decline in the global number of refugees if we accept Palestinian refugees. And uh, in terms of internally displaced people, according to the data uh, from the Internal Displacement Monitoring Center in Geneva, we see fluctuations through most of the 1990s and beginning of the 2000s, and of course in recent years, an increase. So then I say, well, why do we see such an increase if most of these proxy indicators tend to show that there is no increase in what we would refer to as needs. So I was thinking, is it because most of violence today happens outside of armed conflicts? And here you have the 20 most violent countries of the world in terms of their homicide rates. And you see that actually most, more than two thirds of them are countries at peace between brackets, meaning countries where there is not an active armed conflict, and a lot of them are in Central America, the Caribbean, and Southern Africa. That said, if you look at most of the reports from the largest humanitarian organizations, they do not operate in those countries. So this is not a reason. So the last question was, is it because of a huge increase in disasters? Disasters caused by natural hazard. And there, indeed, you see an increase in the number of registered disasters during the 1990s up to 2002, but this was not parallel with a marked increase in the number of people dead, injured, or made homeless because of disasters. So coming back to this question of is it supply or donor driven? I think it's both. It's donor driven, meaning demand driven, because donors resort often to humanitarian action 
as a policy, foreign policy instrument by default, when there is no resolve and political will to solve chronic crisis. But it's also supply driven, and this is a good news, because we see much more numerous relief organizations offering a much broader range of services to people in our, suffering in armed conflicts. I just think when I started uh, as a humanitarian worker, no organization had specific project uh, targeting gender-based violence or targeting specific needs uh, with regard to mental health and disabilities in armed conflicts. Today, many medical organizations go much beyond chronic crisis, uh, much beyond uh, uh, transmittable diseases to really deal with chronic crisis, kidney dialysis, cancer treatment, <coughs> etc. All the more that they operate in middle income countries where this is what is required. So this is more costly and this explains part of the boom. So the second reason why I thought the book was timely is that this sector which is booming is actually in crisis. First, despite relentless efforts to disseminate, promote greater respect for international humanitarian law, war crimes are on the rise. And I think a good case in, po is more in point is the systematic attacks on medical facilities in Syria, in Yemen, by uh, forces uh, which encompass a number of P5, plus, of course, uh, government forces, and this is a real concern. Second, access is highly limited, and in the most dangerous places where actually humanitarian action is mostly required, there is hardly anyone. This is a picture of a report by MSF, uh, Doctors Without Borders, who looked at five of the most uh, dire situation in terms of armed conflicts, and they just question where is everyone? There were 6,000 people at the global human, uh, the World Humanitarian Summit last May in Istanbul, but in places in the heart of armed conflicts, there is hardly any humanitarian organization that is able to operate directly with physical presence, maintaining physical presence to be close to the people suffering the consequences of those conflicts. And finally, there is more attacks in number, in global, global figures. There has been an increase in the number of attacks on humanitarian workers, but worryingly, much more kidnapped for ransom. And kidnap and ransom has become the main concern of many humanitarian organizations in those places. And what is worrying is that it is not only the goods that humanitarian organizations bring to the field, but it's also the humanitarian workers themselves who become valuable resources to finance, war, uh, to finance armed groups and to sustain the war. And the third reason is that, well, <coughs> as, a, as a young graduate in economics, uh, when I started to work with the International Committee of the Red Cross in El Salvador, 27 years ago, I had a few intuitions, and uh, they, they, they were with me for the past 25 years. Uh, one intuition, for instance, in El Salvador, was that uh, I was working in a, in a province which was uh, under the control of the FMLN uh, guerrilla group. And during the first eight months, it was kind of difficult to really get uh, in touch with them, being able to negotiate greater respect for international humanitarian law, and uh, have contacts to discuss about humanitarian concerns. And suddenly the situation changed simply because in neighboring Nicaragua, the Sandinistas lost the elections. And Daniel Ortega had to go his back now. But when he went out, what happened is that actually the FMLN commandancia had to move out to Cuba. So I realized that the few medical you know, goodies and uh, relief that we were bringing there were becoming much more strategic. And thanks to that, it was easier to get access and to have a, a conversation over humanitarian concerns. The second example is uh, the, the sad rationality of massacres. Uh, a year later, I was in uh, eastern Sri Lanka, and uh, I wondered why we had uh, uh, every week uh, massacres uh, pitting actually Tamil Hindus with Tamil Muslims. And 
my explanation has been that actually it was during the rice harvest season and the traders wanted to create uh, a situation of fear which was such that no agricultural worker would dare to bring his agricultural surpluses out of the enclaves. And then the traders were able to buy the rice, rock bottom price, in those enclaves and to ship them outside to make a greater profit. So based on that, based on, the, on all these three elements, finally, my book looks at uh, a number of issues. First, I would say epistemological questions, applying rational choice models to understand the behavior of combatants, the behavior of different individuals in extreme situations. Second, the humanitarian market, which we discussed before. And then four chapters looking at the economics of war, of terrorism, disaster, and survival, looking more at the household level, micro level, with a case study on what's going on in Lebanon with regards to the influx of uh, refugees from Syria. When we apply a rationalized source framework to try to make sense of the social reality, and we look in particular at the case of suicide bombing and suicide terrorism, this is arguably uh, the ultimate paradox of applying rational choice where we, we start from the assumption that individuals are self-interested, utility maximizers, opportunistic, and uh, actually, uh, how can we explain suicide terrorism in this framework? So economists have attempted to look at the situation, for instance, with empirical research with regard to Palestinian suicide bombers, looking how we could understand that they were trading life for posthumous identity with organizations staging, organizing these attacks, and how they were dealing with the commitment problem under contract theory. And I think this provides a new, sheds a new light on the phenomenon, but it leads to a number of policy recommendations which, go, which do not go in the same direction as the policy recommendation that would come from uh, anthropological, sociological, and uh, psychosocial research on the same phenomenon. And this is where interdisciplinary dialogue is absolutely critical. I looked also at the question of compassion, as uh, we call them, actually non-kin altruism, with the case of uh, here MSF workers who uh, decided to risk their life in order to bring assistance to victims of the Ebola crisis. And uh, I can tell you that the, 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 their payroll is very low, the risks were high, and at the same time, when they first arrived, some of them were attacked by the communities who were suspicious about the fact that they were actually bringing Ebola themselves to the communities. <coughs> so the question of the selfless engagement of those people is remarkable, and this is where I think it's interesting just to, to quote a few, <coughs> a few people. I would like to quote the, the father of, of economics, as well as uh, the father of modern humanitarianism. So you might know the quote, famous quote, which appears at the beginning of the theory of moral sentiments of Adam Smith, who recognized that how selfish soever man may be supposed, there are evidently some principles in his nature which interest him in the fortune of others and rendered their happiness necessary to him though he derives nothing from it except the pleasure of seeing it. And if we <clears throat> look at recent advances in neurobiology, indeed, we have seen more and more empirical evidence that shows that non kin altruism is partly ingrained in human nature. At the same time, it's interesting to look at uh, how Henri Dunant, was trying to sell to the monarchs of the day, <clears throat> by, the, by the second half of the 19th century, his first convention on the protection of the, uh, of the war wounded. And his argument was really cost-benefit. 
he wrote in Memory, uh, Memory of Solferino, by reducing the number of cripples, a saving would be effective in the expenses of a government which has to provide pensions for disabled soldiers. And a century later, Jean Pictet, who did the exegesis of the humanitarian principles adopted in 1965, was trying to understand what the principle of humanity means for humanitarian workers. And I was struck by the fact that he came to the conclusion that for the Red Cross, what counts is that the Charitable Act be effective, that it be beneficial to those who suffer. And he started this sentence by saying, <clears throat> after all, the motives which drives the Charitable Act does not matter so much. Whatever the motive, what it counts is actually a consequentialist perspective on the effectiveness of that act. So after reflecting on those issues, I turned to war economies. And looking at war economies, I tried to understand how global financial and trade markets are integrated and play with the local reality faced by humanitarian organizations and the people in different communities. And this is just one example of the NASDAQ, or the dot-com bubble where with a boom and a bust by, by 2000. And this was followed after one or two months by the same curve for the price of Colombo tantalite or coltan, this mineral that is extracted in the east of the Democratic Republic of the Congo. And what happened immediately is that the armed group Rassemblement Congolais pour la Démocratie in Goma, in Kisangani, lost a main source of revenue and turned by decree, actually, to requisition the proceeds of public utilities, water boards and uh, electricity stations or power stations. And after a few months, the, the water boards were not able to buy the chemicals required to purify water. And the, in Kisangani, we were afraid that the power station would simply stop without being able to provide uh, drinking water to the, to the city dwellers. And because of a looming renewed cholera crisis, actually, a humanitarian organization decided to bring immediately from outside 60 tons of chemicals to compensate for that. And my question is, is it the role of humanitarian organization to compensate for the crash of coltan prices and for actually a loss in revenue for armed groups in the region. This is a dilemma. I don't have an easy answer, but we can discuss it later. In terms of what economic analysis can bring to the table, I think that today our colleagues, macroeconometricians, have much to bring in terms of rigorous impact evaluation of specific programs. But we have to be careful the way in which it is, uh, it is done. Here, I just take the example of a number of natural experiments that have been done to understand the effectiveness of winning hearts and minds campaigns, meaning the effectiveness of using aid as a soft weapon to win over the population in Afghanistan and Iraq in favor of the government, the allied forces, and against the insurgency. And there is a number of uh, different uh, evaluation, impact evaluation that have been done, most of which conclude that either using aid for that purpose has been neutral, or in some cases has been positive because it reduced the number of violent attack against uh, allied forces, and it provided more intelligence information from the host communities to the military forces. At the same time, what is intriguing is that when you compare these findings with findings from qualitative field research that has been conducted in the same places, especially in Afghanistan, by colleagues of the Feinstein Center, uh, Tufts University, but through inductive methods, through ethnographic uh, inquiry techniques, the findings are 
totally uh, contradictory because the main finding is that actually using aid for that purpose increased resentment from the population against the allied forces and against the aid enterprise in general. So again, there are contradicting policy recommendations and there is a need for comparing and discussing cross disciplines about such findings. And there is one article which uh, was published a year and a half ago by Marion Fourcad and others called The Superiority of Economists. Maybe some of you know that article, where through uh, quite uh, some research, uh, she has shown with her colleagues in, the, in this article in the Journal of Economic Perspectives that economists tend to have much more policy impact than sociologists and political scientists. And I think that this is uh, an important issue, especially when it comes to such, uh, such research. All the more that to do quantitative research in Afghanistan and Iraq, often the economists have had privileged access, privileged access to databases run by the military apparatus and then feed back directly into the system. <coughs> then, when it comes to a more micro level, looking at households and individuals, uh, it is remarkable to notice the improvement in the capacity of humanitarian organization to assess the needs of the population. 20 years ago, it was really, I would say, rather primitive socio-demographic data with some uh, institutional status uh, studies and it was mainly ex post when uh, we could notice that children were severely malnourished then uh, a food operation was put in place. Today there is much more uh, market-based analysis looking at prices, looking at uh, the role of different uh, actors throughout the market and since we are here in All Souls College I must give uh, credit to, uh, to a fellow of uh, All Souls, Amartya Sen, who uh, through uh, seminal writings and books on famine brought to the attention of the humanitarian community with five, 15 years delay the fact that uh, vulnerability analysis, that entitlements are absolutely critical in order to understand famine, especially in conflict regions. So, actually, the trickle down is very slow. I would say that there is not enough cross fertilization between the scholarly world and uh, the, uh, the, the practitioner world. And as you, I will conclude, it goes in, in both directions. When we look at the vulnerability assessments that have been done for Syrian refugees, especially in Lebanon, it is quite uh, telling to see that. This very sophisticated assessment done every year show that the main stay of uh, household coming from Syria during the first years were access to informal labor. And this has been reduced because of resentment of the Lebanese population and measures taken by the government, especially because uh, the wages for low skilled labor diminished by more than 60% in a year and a half. Uh, agricultural workers were making roughly $15 a day in the Beka Valley before the crisis. This went down to $6 a day uh, after, well, if we, by, by mid-2014. And, uh, of course, when we look at, at also gender issues, domestic workers and uh, sex workers suffered a lot from a complete drop in, in uh, income which also says something about the need for protection of the refugee population. So, finally, we see a switch to cash assistance rather than in-kind assistance, especially in the context of Syrian refugees. And cash assistance seems to be uh, the, the magic bullet for many organizations seeing when we shift to, to cash, we cut transaction costs and we can be more effective in offering refugees, beneficiaries, a choice where they can buy whatever they want, be it uh, needs with, related to education, health, sanitation, or food, etc. But at the same time, I think we have to be very careful about a few things like, with all the money saved, will we leave 
the beneficiaries to the ATM machine alone, or will we reinvest the money saved in more intelligence field work of humanitarian workers within the communities doing protection work and doing solid monitoring work? I think there is a risk here. And second, in some instances, there is a symbolic value of warehouses, trucks, logistics being present. It, it marks a strong presence, which can be reassuring, even if it's not a guarantee of protection for people uh, caught up in civil wars. So I come to the last uh, aspect that I want to highlight, which is actually related to disaster economics, there is a remarkable rise in risk or disaster risk linked securities over the past few years. Uh, these are innovative financial instruments or devices which allow to transfer disaster risks out of the disaster struck country onto the global financial markets. And among the different uh, products, insurance products, we have also the so-called catastrophic insurance bond, uh, uh, which we thought, uh, shortly uh, called CAT bonds. And CAT bonds are quite an interesting uh, vehicle that has been now marketed in the Philippines, in Indonesia, both by the insurance industry, the financial industry, and uh, the aid industry in partnerships. And catastrophic bonds, actually, they work as a, as a bond, except that it is associated with a trigger. And the parametric trigger is related to the intensity of a natural hazard. It can be the speed of the wind, air pressure, or rainfalls, or uh, earthquake magnitude and location. And if the trigger is reached by a natural hazard episode, then the trigger is activated, which means that the, uh, the bond principle has to be forgiven, which means that the loan is turned into a grant for the insurance company that is issuing the bond or for the municipality that is issuing the bond. And then this can be used directly either to pay for uh, insurance payouts or this can be uh, used by the municipality to pay for relief and rehabilitation. And what is, uh, well, maybe two, two issues stand, uh, stands out for me. First, it is a game changer because we have said again and again that prevention is much more effective, efficient than post-disaster relief. Some studies have shown that by investing in prevention, disaster prevention, we can invest only one dollar instead of having to invest seven dollars ex post. But despite all that, there are very negative political economic constraints, which makes prevention uh, politically unattractive. For a politician in power, it's much more attractive to be on the picture when the relief operation uh, generously come to the ground, rather than to increase taxes in order to pay for insurance premium or to pay for preventive devices such as dikes. But the fact that the capital markets today and the insurance industry have a keen interest is a game changer. It changes some of those political economic dynamics. But at the same time, this cooperation with the aid industry is uh, also a competition. And if you look at the marketing <coughs> documentation and communication of the insurance industry in particular, they are very clear about where the competition lies. So to conclude, I would say that humanitarian economics has a, greatly and vast, a great and vastly untapped potential, provided it thrives on interdisciplinary instant, uh, interdisciplinarity and not brushing aside at theoretical aborigines, to paraphrase, uh, the, to paraphrase my, my first slide with, uh, with this um, categorization of other social scientists. And one thing which I'd like, because uh, we have the chance to have a uh, guy with us as a, as, a, as a legal expert, I think we can combine, for instance, uh, economic and legal expertise when it comes to improving the enforcement of international humanitarian law. 
Uh, a Swiss economist, Bruno Frey, looked at why in 1415 the Brits decided to, and King Henry V, decided to depart from the norms of chivalry of that day and to kill all the flower of the French nobility at Azincourt. And one of his understanding is that uh, Henry V did a simple cost-benefit analysis saying, well, first, I should let my knights be able to preserve and then ransom the French nobles, because it's part of uh, you know, their, the prize that they can get out of having uh, uh, staging this war. But at the same time, if we keep this high number of French prisoners, this will be too much, put, put us too much at a military disadvantage in case the French troops reorganize and attack us again. So, because out of military necessity, it's necessary actually to uh, kill them all, almost all of them. And I was intrigued by a conversation I had very recently with a military, uh, with a humanitarian head of office who was working in Afghanistan recently, and he told me, well, in one case, I came across a non-state armed group that had made a lot of prisoners and I felt that they were about to get rid of all these prisoners because they had no means to move with all of them. And although I'm a humanitarian worker, I decided to organize a number of buses and to give warranty to this non-state armed group that I would take all these detainees in those buses, keep them away, and then bring them back to the capital and free them only once they are back in Kabul. Well, what you did is to change actually the cost-benefit calculus of the non-state armed group in that case, which is wonderful in terms of changing the terms of the discussion. Of course, when we discuss today about what to do in order to stop the systematic bombings of medical facilities, it's not that easy when we look at Syria and Yemen, but this is something we can discuss about. Finally, I think that as much as it is necessary for practitioners to tap into uh, scholarly knowledge, as much I would advise students and researchers to engage with practitioners, and I just give one example uh, to conclude. Recently, we had an executive uh, education session with humanitarian workers from Somalia and Syria and uh, Jordan and Afghanistan, and a colleague, political scientist, came to explain well bottom of peace building and state building and the notion of hybrid political orders. And once he explained that notion at length, saying, well, actually, uh, in many of the countries where, where you come from, uh, the, the delivery of uh, welfare and security is not in the sole hands of the government, but it's shared with informal actors, non-state actors, traditional actors, etc. At the end of the session, the practitioner said, OK, we have been navigating these hybrid political orders without knowing it for the past 20 years, and we know very much how to navigate them. What we learned during this session is that now it has a name. <laughs> so I think that in those cases also it's, it's quite remarkable to see the lack of uh, conversation uh, between the two sectors. So with this, I very much look forward to the conversation, and thank you for your attention. Thank you very much indeed, Professor Carboni. A lot of a lot of food for thought, and I think it's going to give rise to some very interesting questions, some very interesting comments. And to get us started, I'd like to turn to and introduce my good friend and colleague, Professor Alexander Betts, who, as many of you will know, is director of the Refugee Studies Centre here in Oxford, but also a very active colleague and innovator in refugee studies overall. Not only an innovator in refugee studies, I should say, but also an innovator in refugee action on the ground. Alex. Thank you very much, Guy, for that introduction. It, it's a huge honour, Gilles, to be able to respond to your book. Um, it's a book that I think is timely, long overdue, and I think many great works are works that you see come onto the market and wonder why they didn't already exist. And you're surprised that nobody had written that book before. It seems so obvious with hindsight, and yet the gap was evident, and the book fills it very well. So I'm quite amazed, Gilles, that you managed to get through your presentation without a single plug 
for your brilliant book. So I'm going to start by doing it for you. Uh, humanitarian economics is available with Hearst in this country, with Oxford University Press in the US. It's a brilliant and wide-ranging book. And it has that very wet, rare quality of opening up more than it forecloses. It's rich in concepts, data, stories, wide-ranging. And in that sense, it's a pioneering and agenda-setting piece of work. It's not what you would necessarily expect uh, all academic monographs to be, tight, closed, narrow, to be cited for one thing, but opens up for many people to draw upon, and I think sets an agenda for graduate students, scholars, and practitioners for generations to come. Just so you know how I approach this, I have no qualification whatsoever to describe myself as an economist. My formal economics training came to, the, to an end at the end of my undergraduate years, and in part it came to an end because I wanted to study the economics of refugees, and I wrote a dissertation applying microeconomics and ideas from the application of microeconomics to uh, the environment, to refugee issues, and my advisors said that that was an absurd thing to be doing. Refugee issues were political, they were anthropological, they were legal, but humanitarianism certainly wasn't an economic issue. So I moved on, became a political scientist, and I've had economics envy ever since, and I've been trying to work my way back into working with collaborators who understand economics. And so what I needed about two decades ago was Gilles' book to not only provide guidance, but to legitimate an area of study. And I think it's very valid, as he highlights, to suggest that humanitarians have rarely considered economics, and economists have rarely considered humanitarian issues. So, at the outset, I can't speak highly enough of the contribution that I think this makes. I want to cover five areas in the spirit of opening up dialogue and offering a way in which I think we can collectively move forwards from this work. And the areas I want to cover are, firstly, the, the scope of humanitarian economics. Secondly, the way in which, as a body of theory, it challenges ideas of rationality and the way we think about behaviour in economics that you touched upon. Thirdly, I want to talk about an area that I think could be built and further developed, which is the economic lives of crisis-affected communities themselves. Fourthly, I want to say something about how this can guide more rational responses. And fifthly and finally, I want to talk about the research agenda and how we can build it. So, in terms of the scope, I think one of the things that's fascinating about the array of areas you cover is there are different sets of puzzles. The puzzles of how we think about altruism uh, and giving, the puzzles of how we think about conflict and terrorism and terrorist recruitment, how we think about response, how we think about finance. And all of these puzzles, in a way, draw upon different areas of existing economic theory. They straddle development economics, conflict economics, you touch upon microeconomics, finance, and in a way humanitarian economics provides an umbrella framing for those different areas. And you seek to couple it with interdisciplinary thinking, to draw in anthropologists, sociologists, qualitative researchers. But I suppose one of the questions that I have that comes from that is, is there anything analytically distinctive about the humanitarian realm that can pioneer new areas of economics? So rather than simply being an umbrella for development economics, for conflict economics, for particular discrete puzzles, are there unique areas from which we could forge a body of theory that was distinctively humanitarian economics in an analytical and theoretical sense? Or is it a unifying umbrella that brings us to an empirical area and an area in which the tools of economics from these disparate areas are needed for practice? Similarly on scope, one of the questions I'm left with is a perennial challenge for humanitarian practitioners. But what is humanitarianism? What are the boundaries of it? Are we thinking mainly about responses to crisis and conflict? I was struck by the chart in which you highlighted deaths, and you interspersed deaths from what's conventionally regarded as the definition of conflict with those that come from areas of non-conflict. And the highest number of deaths per 100,000 was in Honduras, which doesn't have an internal armed conflict but nevertheless was on that list. And so I wonder, is what Honduras is experiencing, is the violence attributable to non-state armed actors in Mexico within the purview of humanitarian economics? Analytically, it seems it has many of the features that you describe, but it falls outside the boundaries of humanitarianism. So these two areas of scope, what's distinctive analytically about the economics of this area, or is it just an umbrella? And what is humanitarianism and what are its boundaries. Related to that, your focus is very much on people affected by conflict and violence. 
And it also leads me to wonder whether we'd be in a different realm in thinking about victims of natural disasters or elements that fall outside the realm of conflict or, or large-scale violence. The second area I wanted to pick up on is, is the area of rationality. Because I think one of the strongest calls and claims that you make in the presentation is the idea that humanitarianism challenges the tenets of basic neoclassical economics. You challenge the idea of the esteem effect that an MSF worker gets um, from working for a humanitarian organisation, taking risks in their life. You question the rationality of the suicide bomber being recruited to a terrorist organisation. But I think in a lot of the economics literature, the way it would respond to that is in a way that seems a little tautological. The way in which the economics of altruism, the work of James Andrioli, for instance, thinks about altruism is that it's rational, self-interested behaviour. Altruism comes from the idea that you derive esteem effects. You can define it away in the sense of there being a rationality and self-interested behaviour that you could draw on an indifference curve. And so I wonder whether, even though it's very clear that there are complexities back to this behaviour, there are elements of identity, there are elements of culture, there are elements of psychology and neuroscience that we need to draw in, is there a way of bridging those epistemological divides? I suppose one of the thinkers in economics who's pioneering in this area is George Akerlof's work, trying to bring norms and culture into the realm of economic thinking. But can those bridges really be, be overcome? And is there a way in which epistemologically we can take account of the different cultural contexts in which humanitarian action takes place, the ways in which not only questions of rationality arise from the giver, but also the victims and the perspectives involved. They're obviously extremely important questions at a point where, as you highlight, humanitarian is moving towards a cash turn. We're taking seriously the rationality of the victims, according them agency to make their own choices in allocating, rather than giving them just uh, food sacks from WFP, tents and what we think they need. We're engaging them in questions where they have agency. So do we need to bridge that divide, or can we actually assume there's a degree of rationality? Um, in work I've done with an interdisciplinary team at the Refugee Studies Centre, comprising economists, anthropologists, political scientists, we've looked at the economic lives and contributions of refugees themselves. And I think that has potentially wider scope for us to think about crisis economics and the behaviour of humanitarian victims more broadly. We've simply looked at the economic <coughs> lives of refugees in camps and urban areas, but equally one might apply that to the battleground context, to internally displaced persons, to victims of natural disaster, and ask how they organise their own lives. And it gives rise to a series of theoretical questions about whether there's anything distinctive about the crisis context for the way in which people live their economic lives. The anthropologist Caroline Nordstrom has written about war in Mozambique, and described it from an anthropological perspective as creative, transformative, changing the fundamental ways in which people conduct their lives and their cultural habits and norms prior to the conflict kicking in. One of the observations we make in our work is that following new institutional economics and the work of people like Douglas North, the refugee camp or the urban context of being a refugee isn't distinctive because the people are particularly different. They're a cross-section of society, they often bring skills, aspirations, talents. What's different is the regulatory environment that's imposed. The institutional context is different. And that creates economies that may be segregated from the wider economy. It may create dual market structures that potentially follow the kind of logics we get in the economics of the kibbutz or the economics of the prison and encourage us to look at the spaces of humanitarianism as institutionally distinctive and requiring a different form of analysis. So my question is a simple one. How would you explore the economic lives of the affected communities in those broader contexts? Fourth area I want to push you on is the question of responses. I think one of the claims you make very strongly is that humanitarian response could benefit from economic thinking. It could make more rational, allocative decisions based on principles of allocative efficiency. One data point that I, I think is interesting that is based on a relatively superficial calculation. But from the data that's available, we appear to spend, through our governments, about $135 in Europe for refugees for every dollar we spend in developing regions of the world on refugees. Now, that's, that's a phenomenally disparate ratio. 
But the questions that follow from that are not just questions of um, allocated efficiency, they're questions of ethics, they're questions of politics. They need to be subjected to normative debate. And I suppose one area in which we've had a, a pioneering set of work in allocated efficiency is climate change. The work of Bjorn Lomberg made quite far-reaching claims about how we were irrationally allocating resources to address climate change. And I suppose is there a fear that we might reasonably have that the introduction of those claims, untempered by normative or political considerations, might lead to their abuse by governments and political actors to distort some of those areas of resource allocation, not least given the claim you made that policymakers are more, listen, more likely to listen to the um, expert authority of economists than those from other disciplines, such as moral philosophers and those with the ethical toolbox to make sense of those claims. I also wonder, and this is just a sort of a slightly parochial interest, but I wonder what you think about the contribution that might be made by work on institutional design. Um, in a lot of resource allocation in areas for the displaced, for instance, there's been little work to draw upon ideas that have been pioneering in terms of quotas, vouchers, matching markets uh, that have been applied in food banks and other areas. Are those areas that we want to import into humanitarian thinking to redesign global institutions? And fifthly and finally, the question I want to leave you with is, and I'll frame it in economic terms, if someone gave you about $10 million to build a research agenda on humanitarian economics, what questions would you ask? What empirical data would you collect? And what methods would you use? Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Alex. Would you like to take up that agenda? Pleasure. First, Alex, thank you very much for your comments, for taking the time to go through the book and for your very rich feedbacks and questions. I'm not sure that I can respond to all of them, but uh, I, I will try to really take them. And I must say that I look very much also to being able to buy your book and read your recent book that uh, certainly deals with a number of the issues that you have raised uh, right now. So let me start with your first point, the question of scope. Indeed, I have been playing for a while with what is the precise scope of humanitarian economics, and that very much disband also to what is the actual scope of humanitarianism and how we define it and how we define humanitarian action. And what I can see is that there is today a lot of uh, contested concepts, especially coming from different traditions and uh, knowledge ecologies that do not buy the self-referential and instrumental definition of humanitarian action that has been established by humanitarian organizations and donors for themselves. And uh, I have been trying to figure out, and this is in the second chapter where I look also at uh, very violent societies, but which are not societies which are formally in a country that is registered within the database as a country having an ongoing civil war armed conflict. And my main question has been, okay, to what extent do we see in those uh, uh, instances uh, humanitarian organizations <coughs> and non-humanitarian organizations <coughs> providing something which resembles humanitarian action, which is basically a set of efforts to save lives, alleviate suffering, and protect dignity despite the high level of violence. And it's true that there has been quite some attempts by relief organizations, humanitarian organizations, to work in uh, Rio de Janeiro, to work in, uh, uh, in Port au Prince, and uh, in Honduras and Guatemala. But all these attempts have been pilot projects, minimal, and uh, have not led to any growth in these type of activities. So I took possibly, <coughs> based on that, the decision to say, well, I will actually restrict the scope of uh, humanitarian economics to <coughs> crises, which by a misnomer we call humanitarian crises, which are mainly either situations where international humanitarian law applies, is applicable, or in situations of large-scale disasters, 
called by natural hazard. And I then looked at terrorism in particular because in most or in a lot of uh, countries where uh, IHL applies, actually you have a number of non-state organizations operating there which are designated as terrorists. And this, as you know, is a, is a, is a <coughs> big challenge and a, a very serious issue for uh, human organizations. So I came back to a very traditional and I would say Geneva-like definition of humanitarianism. And this is in this framework that I started to look at humanitarian economics. That said, I think it's high time to really work, and this would be in the research agenda that I have something which I would really wish that we have much more research together with colleagues, and not only economists, but also uh, historians, sociologists, uh, philosophers, and others, to look at major human concepts used in the humanitarian sector and to look at their history and the trajectory of uh, those concepts in different traditions, both through space and time. Because I think we are in a bubble tower where when we uh, discuss across, uh, well, I discussed about uh, humanitarianism and humanitarian economics in South Africa, China, and I think that we do not understand each other with uh, many scholars there when we discussed about that. And this is high time as a priority, I would say, in terms of research. Uh, what is unique in epistemological terms, in terms of looking at uh, well, how humanitarian economics approaches uh, so the social reality? I think the way I looked at it is uh, to start with basic neoclassical economics, which up to this day still uh, is mainstream economics, and applying costs benefit calculus to a wide range of challenges, issues related to what we see now in economies affected by war and disaster. And from there, I moved on to the micro level to wonder whether we can make sense of the behavior, not only of combatants, but also of humanitarian workers themselves and of the behavior of uh, individuals within households in uh, conflict-affected communities. There is a, a wide range of empirical literature that has extended the way we understand costs and benefits in order to be able to do exactly what you referred to as, for instance, <coughs> factoring as benefits, self-esteem, a sense of dignity, shame and many other primary and secondary emotions uh, studied by social uh, psychologists and to actually, in what we some people call economic imperialism, integrate this in standard cost-benefit analysis. But I think that if we go back to a very interesting debate that raged in the 70s and 80s between, uh, especially within uh, economic anthropology, between the substantivist and the functionalist debates where people thinking that economic rationality can apply across the globe and others, the substantivists, saying no, in so-called primitive societies where barter trade, non-monetized exchange prevails, actually uh, behavior can be much better explained by uh, looking at reciprocity, looking at uh, clientelism relation, fear, and other uh, <clears throat> aspects that go much beyond economic rationality. I think today we are well beyond that debate, although it's still an interesting debate, especially if we look at uh, humanitarian actors presently in the Central African Republic or the, of South Sudan. But I think that with the advances in behavioral economics, what we have there is a very interesting way to expand beyond neoclassical economics. And for instance, when wondering how to improve the way we seek to promote greater respect for international humanitarian law, to uh, take into consideration the fact that armed groups and armed actors uh, behave and think not only automatically, but uh, along <coughs> pre-established social and mental models and social norms, and that those social norms and these pre-established 
mental models can actually evolve extremely quickly and change radically in just a couple of months when you have, uh, for instance, the beginning of the civil war in, in, uh, in Syria. And I think this deserves much more research to understand actually how social norms that held society together and that has been uh, prevalent uh, during uh, many decades where the troops, the military, had been uh, trained in uh, knowing and abiding by international humanitarian law can actually be disrupted extremely quickly in a case of extreme uh, violence. And uh, the question is how do you step by step restore such uh, norms? Uh, an interesting question which I think is also there is uh, how useful is it today to insert in, uh, in video games uh, international humanitarian law uh, limits in the exercise of violence for youth and how much this might actually contribute to reinforce pre-established mental models that one day might be uh, quite useful uh, if, uh, if um, war erupts in, in the societies where those work outside. I mean, if those uh, youngsters come to uh, participate in hostilities. So th this is also something which I think would deserve uh, it would be a great research agenda. On non-kin altruism, um, I think we have uh, we benefit greatly from uh, advances, especially through uh, brain imagery techniques and neurobiology, evolutionary biology as well, to try to understand how much this is the result of evolutionary misfiring. And uh, how actually what interests me in this debate is as a, as a professor, as a trainer, we see that there is a tend to have a, a, you know, a risk of institutional anomaly in the humanitarian sector as it professionalizes, as it grows, and uh, as it becomes uh, well, ever more sophisticated but also bureaucratic. And I think that by understanding better what fuels the humanitarian imperative to respond, to act, through uh, interdisciplinary, uh, in-depth interdisciplinary uh, research, we might be much better able also within organizations to move towards much more professionalism and effectiveness while preserving the, the, the fundamental humanitarian impulse, which is absolutely necessary to promote super erogatory acts. Um, yeah. To look at the economic life of uh, households and individuals affected by armed conflict, I think it's also high on the agenda. We understand, we do understand a bit better, but still uh, not enough, how conflicts affect changes, uh, economic relations, both within households and uh, between households within communities. And uh, I think that this is a, a, a research agenda which starts to be taken more seriously, especially by practitioners through more rigorous and in-depth uh, needs assessments, techniques, and proximity with the, the, the households uh, and, and the people, victims of conflict. But this would still deserve much more research also uh, by, by economics, and this is certainly an area of humanitarian economics which is under research at present. Yeah, I think I will stop here, but we can continue the conversation and open the conversation. Mm -hmm. uh, Alex, if I may come back to you later for any, any comments on the comments, that would be good. But let's see, um, let's see what uh, the presentation and the and the discussion by our both very able presenters have, uh, have, have inspired in you. Does anyone have a camera comment or a question that they'd like to make? Yes, so that is that Adam at the back. Uh, thanks for a really interesting presentation. It does make one think fresh about these issues. Um, I've got two uh, questions about arise from what you said. Uh, the first uh, you just mentioned the importance of getting concepts, concepts and terminology and goals clear. And there's one term that often strikes me as being used very vaguely in, in uh, all kinds of humanitarian work, and that's the term protection. 
which often refers to three completely different things, either a legal status or uh, without use of overt violence, moving people out of the place of danger is the second possibility. Or the third is physical armed uh, protection. And it is extraordinary how often uh, the term protection is used in a very broad and general way without uh, precision. And in, in your heroic efforts to get clarity of discussion of these things, I'd be interested to know um, where that uh, fits. And this, the second question uh, arose in my mind is to do with funding. Um, and the curiosity that a great deal of the, the overwhelming majority, as far as I'm aware, of humanitarian work is uh, funded on what might be termed a voluntary basis. It's not part of a UN taxation system of, of states. Um, and so far, humanitarian organizations seem to have been reasonably content to keep it that way. It must seem a little bit unusual to an economist to see things working on this peculiar basis, and I'd be interested in your comments on it. Thank you. And there was a question on this. Yes. Please. Yeah. Oh, yes, I very interesting your talk, but I wondered if I could persuade you to move from microeconomics to macroeconomics in, in two respects. One respect is that uh, the humanitarian aid is so big that it has, really does affect the economy of the country and can change its exchange rate, undermine it in various ways, prevent productive activities, and also may have positive things. But I think that's an area which should be explored. The other very important trend at the moment is that an increasing proportion of aid is going to humanitarian aid. In fact, um, we're pushing more and more in the UK in that direction. So I think that when you look at humanitarian aid, you need to consider the costs to the people who would have got the, the aid. And in fact, what's happening is that the very poor people, say in, even in areas which are subject to conflict but not yet get humanitarian aid, like say in northern Nigeria, may be being deprived because of this, this trend. So I wondered if you'd comment on that. Thank you. Yes. Uh, I, I come from the sort of humanitarian side, really. I'm interested in how you see uh, the academic research, I mean, all of those intellectual endeavours uh, impacting on the humanitarian effort. I mean, my experience in the humanitarian field is that there's a, a mismatch of terminology, a, um, uh, an impatience with uh, over intellectualisation. Um, and uh, on the other side, there's maybe. Um, uh, slightly patronising attitude towards humanitarians from uh, people whose business is intellectual uh, and who don't think they can be understood by, uh, I have enough personal anecdotes to illustrate if you want them. Um, uh, uh, within the humanitarian field at the moment, there is um, a sort of a drive towards uh, evidence. I mean, evidence is the big buzzword at the moment. But it, I mean, you referred to uh, that sort of post, post ex facto drive within the within the humanitarian field for understanding things afterwards, and I and I think there's there, there's an interesting conundrum really is how you make how how you fit those things together, which is a research agenda that might try to influence and uh, a sphere of activity that is maybe not very happy to be influenced or not susceptible to that influence. And the last thing I'd like to throw into that is that part of the humanitarian side is the you know, you've talked about um, the various reasons why people engage in humanitarianism. I mean, if I can talk personally, it was the adrenaline. And I don't know how you account for that economically. I mean, you know, it was wanting to get out there and do it, to, the, the, to see the results. I mean, there, there's something immediate about it, and that's, that's immediate experience. That, that I, I, I personally found hard matching in the context of the university where I now am, and I think it's an interesting challenge for you with a research agenda, how you're going to influence people like I was before I came to the university. <laughs> <laughs> I can see there are other questions coming up, so let's, let's take that three, those three first, and I'll ask you to comment and uh, then Alex to react. Okay. I think you might. Um, 
Yeah, I, I will start by uh, Sir Adam and, uh, and Francis' question on funding and move on from there. Uh, <laughs> first, funding in, indeed, when we look overall, I, I looked at the share of humanitarian funding in total ODA, Official Development Assistance. It was 1% in the 70s, it was 3% by the end of the Cold War. It's ab above 10% today. And I hear the UK that tends to uh, the tendency to say, well, we, we cannot in, you know, increase a lot the overall envelope, so let's shift towards uh, more humanitarian aid. And actually, the same ha happens exactly in Switzerland. It's politically possibly more rewarding for Minister of Foreign Affairs. It's more interesting and it's less controversial because it's more conservative than development, which is about social transformation. So I see more and more of that. And uh, uh, indeed, there are trade-offs. But at the same time, humanitarian organizations are working the latest report about humanitarian funding, the Global Humanitarian Assistance Report, shows that the 20 major humanitarian aid recipients have been in chronic crisis for more than eight years. So humanitarians say that we stay there for eight years, 10 years, 20 years, 30 years because of chronic crisis. And uh, development actors go there because of fragile institutions and fragile states. So they work in the same environment for different purposes, of, under different rationale. And I think that there is a huge appetite nowadays from, I wouldn't say the humanitarian worker on the ground, but humanitarian uh, policy makers for more engagement with uh, the academics, uh, researchers, and academics to, to you know get much greater clarity on this road, you know the, the, the interaction between humanitarian relief and, and development work in general, and to better you know understand how they engage because they do move from what they were doing 20 years ago to a, an area where they, they are not equipped, but they have to move because you know the opportunity is there. It's a very competitive market and. Uh, Humanitarian actors are expanding in terms of services, activities, but also working ever more with institutions, with structures where they are sometimes poorly equipped to really do uh, proper work. In terms of funding, it's true, it's voluntary funding. And following uh, the, the last week election and, and uh, you know, the election of uh, President-elect Trump, there are some worries and concerns, especially for organizations, UN organizations like the World Food Program and UNHCR, which are funded about 40% of their budget by the United States of America. And we might expect the Trump administration not to be very lenient or generous with the UN. So my understanding is that the core funding of the you know, US dues to the UN is just above 20% of the total budget. But a lot of the funding by the US is our earmarked voluntary contributions. And uh, uh, I guess that some of those organizations that are, you know, that are above 30% or about a third of their budget funded by USAID and the State Department uh, might face uh, difficult times. Uh, this is maybe one thing which also relates to um, a comment by, by Alex uh, in a question, where we see you know, social impact bonds inspiring certain humanitarian organizations to say, let's do humanitarian impact bonds, let's try to have a new uh, humanitarian uh, well, financial <coughs> instrument that helps diversify away from government funding to uh, you know, uh, a broader range of funding sources to support humanitarian action. And it will be very interesting to see if this is just fashion of the day or if it can become more substantial than it is at present. In terms of uh, the relationship between academics and uh, humanitarians, uh, I fully appreciate and agree with uh, what you said. I, as mentioned, uh, I think humanitarian Workers have been not very interested for many years or decades about advances, including when you look at work and studies that have been doing, uh, done on conditional and unconditional cash assistance in development work. It's been out there for 20 years, and it's only a few years that uh, humanitarians have started to think about the use of cash assistance to, you know, to move from in-kind to cash assistance. 
But again, I think the times are changing. It's so complex now uh, that uh, there is more appetite for that. And with regards to how to deal with younger humanitarian workers, you know, postgraduate students wanting to engage, uh, this relates very much back to what I said, which is actually how to stimulate, maintain, and breed uh, reflective practitioners which have, the, you know, which have this fuel of you know, an imperative to act, to react, to respond, while not discouraging them with overly bureaucratic and uh, complex uh, operating guidelines and uh, environment, which I can see that is leading to institutional enemy in, in a couple of uh, organizations. And this is a big challenge because the sector is getting ever more mature and, and large and uh, is losing some of its kind of, uh, maybe some of the traits that attracted you to the sector back then. A little um, historical footnote on funding. Uh, Friedhof Nansen and the League of Nations raised loans on the London market to finance refugee resettlement schemes in Bulgaria and Greece, amongst others. The loans were repaid, but more to the point, they paid 7%. Can anyone remember what 7% was like? <laughs> Alex, did you want to come in on I'm <coughs> just really briefly. I mean, I, I just wanted to come back on Adam's question um, and Gilles' response about the relationship between um, compulsory contributions on the one hand and the trend towards voluntary and particularly earmarked contributions in humanitarianism. I mean, it strikes me that one of the things is that people in external relations departments who are responsible for fundraising don't have much of an underlying conceptual framework for how they fundraise. Earmarking can be a very positive thing. Uh, but equally it could be very problematic and it depends really on the framing of what you're appealing to. I mean if we take a sort of global public goods theory approach to funding, common pooling can be a very useful device if you're likely to be dealing with global public goods on which there's free riding. Equally, allowing governments to earmark in certain areas where the benefits accrue to them as individual providers can be very positive. And so it strikes me that with some basic framing fundraisers for these international humanitarian organizations could end up doing a much better job with some basic political economy tools. The only other thing I wanted to mention was something that, two themes that I think Gilles has brought up, which I think are really important, is one, overcoming the, the practitioner-academic divide, and the other, overcoming the qualitative-quantitative divide. And I was really struck in your presentation when you highlighted the example of work on hearts and minds where the randomized control trial showed almost the opposite results from the qualitative research. And it strikes me that a research project, if it's going to get good data, has to be doing qualitative research and quantitative research within the same project across disciplines, and has to be engaging practitioners. And engaging the practitioners helps with access and is likely to help with more accurate data as a result of that contextual understanding. Yes. <coughs> Yeah, thank you. I really enjoyed your talk. I just want to encourage you to say a little bit more about the politics of evidence in the humanitarian field, or maybe, maybe the politics of humanitarian action, the role, role of evidence in it. I mean, we've spoken about the divide between quantitative and qualitative divide between research and academics, but I mean, if we look at what's happening, say, in this country or in the US, with you know, some talk about the rise of post-truth politics, and you know, we've had years of supposedly evidence-based efforts at evidence-based policy making is now an open rejection. Uh, so something's gone wrong in terms of how so-called experts have presented the facts. And just wondering if you see any lessons for what you're trying to do. So lessons for the effort to introduce more um, analysis, more evidence into your field. What, what are the main dangers when you try to do that in terms of the larger politics mm. and other forces that determine whether or not, for example, political projects get funded? Thank you. And the gentleman next to you, I think, yes? Yes. Um, two points I would like to draw attention to. The first is um, media attention. Um, so if uh, this, this summer in Jordan, um, speaking to UNHCR colleagues, there was a quote that quite stuck in my mind, which was, for now, funding situation is not great, but we're, we're getting along. Uh, have another earthquake in Haiti, and uh, the world will forget about Syria. Now, a couple of weeks later, we actually had a hurricane in, in Haiti. It's still too early to see um, whether that changes aid flows towards uh, the region. 
but um, we do see quite a lot of forgotten crises in the world and neither um, a ethics uh, view nor a rational economics view can I think really explain why we forget some of these crises and maybe you have a stance uh, on that. Is there another question from the Yes. Hi, uh, I, I, Michael Pinto Dushinsky. I, 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 I was uh, very interested in this upward graph of amounts of money being spent uh, and uh, was thinking about the bureaucratic uh, forces that are involved in, in my own in, involvement, which is less with humanitarian and more with democracy promotion aid. I've been very struck by the growth of the bureaucracies, government-funded bureaucracies, uh, and of their funding, uh, and of the rates of pay of people who are in that, uh, and, uh, and became very interested in the class of travel uh, that the different organizations give. Uh, and I would certainly suggest that one interesting piece of research uh, would be both in the size of the bureaucracies, the humanitarian bureaucracies, like UNHCR and others, and second, uh, their travel policies uh, as to when they give club pass tickets uh, and how much they spend on them versus uh, other things. Uh, I mean, I know that the only time I've ever had a first class ticket was from the UN, uh, and a senior official told me how within their rules uh, you uh, reckon to get one. Uh, uh, and uh, I, th I think that there's a great pressure uh, in what you call the aid industry to have the benefits not to the médecins sans frontières people who are at the front line, but all of the bureaucrats behind that make a, a pretty good living out of it. And so are there any statistics that will show us say, comparative um, policies on club class tickets for humanitarian uh, government workers. And hotels. <laughs> I think it's been many years, I'd probably say decades, if ever, that a UN official ever travelled first class, Michael, I'm afraid. Um, there were certainly rules about business class, but even those have changed, I regret to say, for those who have to travel on UN business. Uh, there's increasing use of, uh, of budget airlines, I, I speak from experience. Gilles, would you like to take first bite of those? With pleasure. Uh, I will start by uh, MSF. Uh, I had the chance to serve uh, as their treasurer uh, for four years recently, uh, which, is, uh, which allowed me to know a bit about uh, salaries and, and business class. And now, what is remarkable is that MSF is the largest purely humanitarian NGO, and it's funded 92% by individuals like you and me. And they have the luxury to say to uh, Brussels, sorry, we don't accept any more any money from you. And it's Brussels who says, oh, too bad, because we know you do a good job and we would like to fund you. And uh, they don't accept money from a lot of governments. Uh, even sometimes they have problems with Switzerland, can you imagine? So, so they are very worried. At, and at the same time, and this comes back to the other question with regard to what to do, you know, to, to preserve the sector, they tend to be very self-critical, openly. So uh, I had left the ICRC, which is different in terms of corporate culture, but when I was with MSF in my first meetings, I was just struck by the fact that we spent most of our time with our donors, individuals of the association, saying we were really bad in Somalia, we, we missed it, you know, we, we could have done so much better, we, we, we were terrible, we did so many mistakes, and at the end of the day, everybody applauds and gives more money, because you are serious, you are self-critical, you say, well, it's, it's a shame what we did in Somalia. You know, it's, it's a shame, we are not proud of what we have done, we have to do it harder. And this is something I think people feel and sense, and uh, this is very successful in terms of fundraising. And they cap also their salaries, and uh, they are very strict on uh, no business class whatsoever. So, so I think that uh, now that we are you know, in post-truth politics, this kind of truth perspire somehow 
people sense that this is an organization you might give 50, 50 pounds because you might think that it's really people uh, using that money to be front responders and not using too much of that money for something else. And uh, it's interesting because I think even in post-truth politics, uh, a lot of the curve of uh, funding for MSF is going uh, up. I was, it's, it's an anecdote, but uh, we had uh, in the movement decided to cap growth at 7% per year. And we, the operational center in Geneva, could not achieve this target. We were growing at 10 or 12% every year. And we were criticized by Paris and, uh, you know, and the other uh, Brussels and Amsterdam, the other operational center, to say you are becoming too grow, too, too, you are becoming too big within our organization. We have to grow at a reasonable pace. So this was remarkable, but we cannot say to our donors, no, stop funding us because we... So, so this is, I think, an interesting example uh, that uh, today with a, a lot of discussion about, you know, elites and experts, and how this is perceived more broadly is, uh, gives some indications. I'm very uh, down to earth, but I think sometimes we have to when it comes to those issues. Um, so this was the, the, the first comment on the, on the yeah, long term, uh, the question of, of uh, the fact that we are now in the, in a protracted crisis in, uh, with Syrian refugees. I'm sure that I have experts next to me, so I, I, I won't go at length, but in the case of Lebanon, for instance, what is striking is that once we have shifted to cash assistance, it's de facto social protection that is uh, being provided to, to Syrian refugees. And of course, the idea would be very quickly to shift that to a, a social protection system that covers both uh, vulnerable Lebanese and vulnerable Syrian refugees. And the thing is that for that we should build the Lebanese state in order to be able to provide social protection to uh, its uh, uh, vulnerable residents. But first, uh, as you might know, uh, in Lebanon it's uh, mainly sectarian politics, so social protection <coughs> is given by sectarian political groups to their own constituents uh, and not by the central state. Second, within the central state, the most performing uh, wing of that state is uh, the Hezbollah and uh, for obvious reasons the international community is not in a, situa in a position to fund and strengthen a state where the Hezbollah is a major stakeholder. So we are in a situation where we, we know what to do but we cannot. And, uh, and this is uh, also one of the reasons I think why a lot of uh, refugees finally uh, do not see any future in Lebanon and uh, start to, to, move, uh, to move on uh, <coughs> further in their journey. So it's, it's very complex, it's very specific in the case of Turkey, it's another war game. I, I don't know Turkey so much, but I, I know that they had this attempt to provide <coughs> labor permits for uh, Syrian refugees and I think it's a, it's a great idea. Now the way it is actually implemented, I, I, I'm not, uh, I, I don't know about it enough. And finally, the media attention and forgotten crisis. What is remarkable, you know, since I'm interested in the humanitarian sector and humanitarianism, it's always one or two concomitant crises at max. And uh, since 2012, we have had sometimes five CNN-like top crises, top making news. It was uh, Ukraine at the same time Syria, at the same time Sudan and South Sudan possibly Central African Republic, and the Ebola crisis, uh, Yemen. And I think this is stretching the sector to the limit. But it means that we have been able to focus on more than just one crisis at a time. At the same time, there are so many other crises that are simply not on the radar screen of uh, international media. And there, I think it's rejoicing to see a few media outlets. Uh, it's the case, for instance, of even news that tries to systematically report on forgotten crises. And it's uh, part of what humanitarian actors should do, actually, is to raise the attention of governments and the public in general about forgotten crises. But uh, this often does not pay in terms of funding, because uh, if it's not on the radar screen of donors, it's difficult to get then funding for them. Just wanted to have a quick <coughs> response to Martin's question about how 
data engages with policy in this area. Um, I think there's an unprecedented demand for data on humanitarian issues. I mean, being part of the World Humanitarian Summit process, it was one of the big themes. How can we improve research, thinking, and data for humanitarianism? And policymakers have that demand. One of the challenges is what policymakers mean by data is different from what academics generally mean by research. And that leaves a gap in terms of who fulfills that demand for usable data that can be incorporated into performance change. Um, in the development sector, you have actors like the World Bank that, for better and sometimes worse, provide that data. ICMPD, IOM is getting its act together. In humanitarianism, there really isn't a sort of sector brain or a sectoral think tank that provides that data support. And the academic sector is, is relatively early stage. I also think a lot of the academic work tends to generate concepts and hypotheses more than it collects the data to test and explore those hypotheses. And in this conversation, what I find fascinating about it is the number of testable hypotheses that have been generated. I mean, Gilles was talking about why refugees move onwards from Lebanon. Um, the question about the media was why attention and funding shift from crisis to crisis in particular ways. Um, Francis asked the question of, well, what's the substitution effect as we get humanitarian crises and the effects on the development sector? All of those are areas where collection of data can respond empirically to those questions. But who's doing that? It doesn't exist. So I wonder, just to throw out a random idea, whether something is needed which is a sort of humanitarian behaviours lab that isn't just an economic space but draws upon social psychology, anthropology, or the disciplines Gilles has referred to, and actually tests some of these hypotheses, collects the data, and supplies that in a meaningful way to practitioner organisations. Thank you very much indeed. Are there any further questions or comments? Well, in which case, I would uh, be very grateful if you would join me in thanking both our presenter and our discussant for stimulating in, uh, investigation of, I think, what's going to be a very fruitful source area of inquiry in the, in the years to come. Before I do that, though, formally, I would like to mention that just over there on my right, uh, there are copies of Gilles' book, Humanitarian Economics, which I am sure he would be prepared to part with for an appropriate sum, together with a signature. But in the meantime, would you please join me in thanking both of our, our colleagues for what has been a great evening. Thank you.